everybody, Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the extraordinary honor and pleasure of chatting with bassist, vocalist, songwriter. You've seen him with the Moody Blues, John Lodge. Yay! Hey, how are you? <laughs> outstanding, outstanding. It's so great to talk. We've got a lot of exciting things coming down the pike, but I always like to talk about the past. How did you get started in music and on bass? Music didn't come into my life really until I was about 30. Uh, that's when rock and roll happened. I remember where I went to school, about half a mile away was a cafe with a rock and a jukebox in. Mm -hmm. And every lunchtime, I put my lunch money uh, in the slot mm -hmm. <laughs> and listened to the latest record by uh, people like Little Richard, Fat Domino, Jerry Lee Lewis. And I was intrigued by the left-hand side of the piano. I wanted to know what made rock and roll for me. Was it the vocalist? It was always uh, an enigmatic figure, really, mm -hmm. icon, which English people sort of weren't. <laughs> was it that? Was it the song? Was it the guitar? What was it that really motivated me? And I realized it was the left-hand side of the piano, mm. uh, all the boogie playing. And um, I was fascinated by it. And so when I started to learn to play the guitar, I was learning all Buddy Holly songs uh, because to me he was the man, right, mm -hmm. for songwriting. And he, he showed me the way that an ordinary person from a working class family in England could master rock and roll. Mm -hmm. And uh, so as I was learning chords for the Buddy Holly songs, this left hand side of the piano still was intriguing me. And so I learned all these riffs on the bottom four strings of my guitar. You have to remember at that time in Birmingham, there was no electric basses. I didn't know what electric bass was. Mm -hmm. This first person I ever saw playing one was the bass player in the, the group called the Trenius, hmm. who visited England. They were in the movie The Girl Can't Help It, which was probably the greatest rock and roll movie ever. <laughs> and. Uh, I saw this guy playing what I thought was a white Fender Stratocaster guitar and suddenly realized it only had four strings and that was his, that I thought, I've got to buy a bass, I've got to find a bass guitar. And the first one I bought was Nobody Knows, you can't even find them now on the internet. It was called Tuxedo Solid Bass. And it was solid. It weighed a ton. Uh -huh. And uh, I built my own cabinet with a, a 20 watt amplifier and a 12 inch speaker. And I learned all, you know, playing. And I got so intrigued with it, uh, a driving force from that bass. And then one day I went to my music store on a Saturday morning as all body musicians did and still do today. And there in the window it said, direct from the USA, Fender Precision Sunburst Bass. Oh. And uh, I went, oh, that's it. It was like, what? The heavens just opened up for me. And I remember racing home to my dad and say, Dad, You've got to come help me. Mm. And they did. I went back up to the uh, music store and I bought that bass that day. And it's recorded, that was 1960. And it's recorded nearly every Moody Blues song I've ever recorded. And I still use it now. My new recording, to it, which I made last year, all on that bass. I can still smell that bass from the very first day wow. I bought it. It's, it had made so, such an impression on me. I'm sure your father would be pleased about the return on his investment. 
into into your instrument because so many times parents will get an instrument for their child and only to see it left in a corner a short while after but this this was a great success so uh, as far as learning are you self-taught or did you pursue formal studies no totally self-taught uh, I, I remember taking the bass to my bedroom and staying in there <laughs> you know 24 hours a day basically trying to learn how it worked and what notes worked with what chords I had no musical education at all but I could seem to hear what the bass should be doing in a song. And uh, I never really bothered to find out uh, at that time scales or anything. I, I just wanted to play what sounded right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, that's what I did, really. I investigated it, kept playing, played along to other songs with, you know, on the radio in those days, you couldn't hear the bass parts. You could hear the melody and you could hear the chord structure. Mm -hmm. So I used to try and play along with these songs and, uh, yeah, and de develop my own style of playing, really. Excellent, excellent. And then the Moody Blues, how did all that come about? Because that followed this whole thrust. Yeah, well, the Moody Blues came together in those days we were playing in public pubs in England, mm -hmm. like little, little clubs. And the pubs were all, all owned by two breweries. Uh, and the one brewery was called Ansel's, and the other one was called Mitch's and Bottler's. And they wanted a band from Birmingham to play in their clubs. And they wanted to use their logo, which was M and B. Hmm. And so they approached different people to form this band. And Ray Thomas and I were in a band called Al Wyatt and the Rebels. And Mike Pinder played in that band for a short time. And Graham Edge played in a band called Jerry Levine at the Avengers. And Denny Lane played in a band called Denny Lane and the Diplomats. And Ray said to me, John, we're going to form this super group mm. for the pubs and we're going to go professional. And I uh, basically I had 18 months still to go uh, at college. And I said, well, I want to finish my college uh, degree first, which I did. And in the meantime, the band recorded Go Now, which was a big hit. And uh, about a year later, <laughs> after that record, Ray rang me up and said, hey, Rocker, you always called me Rocker. Mm -hmm. Hey, Rocker, have you finished college yet? <laughs> and I said, I have. And he said, get down to London. Denny, Denny Lane's left and we got to get the old band together again. And that was it. Uh, so I went down to London and uh, met up again with Ray and Mike and, uh, uh, and Graham. And then I met Justin at the same time. And the rest is the rest. Wow. Well, and when you talk about the rest, we're talking about an over 30-year run of a, a plethora of hits, many of which you wrote as well, which ties into songwriting and, and your vocals, which I find fascinating because a lot of times you sing in a, in a, like a falsetto in a higher register, yet you're, you're at the low end at the other yeah. extreme. I remember reading somewhere once, I, I can't think who it was who read it. It's like the bottom of the valley and the highest of the mountain, and you've got to reach those two places. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I'm very, very fortunate that I, I can sing in a falsetto voice, but the falsetto voice doesn't sound falsetto. I can make it sound falsetto. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can actually almost do it in sort of full voice. So it's, it, it's interesting. Yeah. Because what it means, you, if, if Justin sang a lead line, or Ray or Mike or a lead line, I, I could sing the octave above it and give it 
almost a shadow. And uh, yes. it was, it's really uh, interesting. That was one of the vocal secrets of the Moody's, because four of us sang. Mike could be, would be in the bass area, Ray would be in the tenor bass, and then Justin and White would be in the high tenor, or soprano, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had a, a full spectrum of uh, harmony. Well, and it's so unique because I think a lot of the consumers in the early days of rock, in, and you guys were pioneers in that sense, because so much of it was a lot more, I'll say, simplistic. And uh, so many tunes. Uh, I recall, you know, if you knew three chords, you could be... <laughs> in a band you know yeah. and but there was a, a greater degree and again incorporating those different parts of harmony and those structures was a very iconic kind of sound i think so because you know we managed to put into the chord sequences particularly like minors and minor sevenths mm -hmm. and suspended notes and um, they they able to create uh, the Moody Blues sound, you know. Uh, even when we look at a song and say the song was in C, I may just play a, a G bass, G bass, and change the structure mm. uh, of the song, or a B B B on the bass, or something. Yeah. You know, just just trying to uh, get this different sound, make it vibrate within the song, and. Um, it seemed to work for the Moody's. Yes, absolutely. Well, and that brings us to kind of present times. You have an album coming up, The Royal Affair and After. And if I understand correctly, a big part of that is tribute to your bandmates as well. Tell us a little bit about that project. I was invited to be on the S Tour 2019 mm -hmm. called The Royal Affair. And it was the Yes and me and... Carl Palmer and uh, the wonderful world of Arthur Brown, and uh, we had a fantastic tour, uh, and uh, we we played about thirty concerts across uh, uh, America, and we were in Las Vegas in an indoor arena there, and indoors is always great because the sound system and everything else, and we recorded the concert. Uh, not for any reason, really. I wasn't thinking about a live album at all, but I recorded the concert. And after the tour, I went on my own tour and I recorded my stage show, which was basically called Keeping the Moody Blues Music Alive. And in it, I put a, a tribute to Mike and Ray. And, of course, uh, I got Graham re-recorded the late lament the poetry mm -hmm. for me so i could play that live and graham's uh, voice coming over the uh, pa system to the audience and uh, and uh, john davison from yes uh, joins me on stage and uh, john came and sang nice in white satin nice. so you know i wanted to do nice in white satin because the bass part and the vocals and the harmony has been, you know, the soundtrack of my life, really. And I wanted to continue that, but I didn't want to sing the song because it, it was always just him. Uh, so, but John came along and sang the song and it's fabulous. And it, it's got a fantastic uh, voice, John. And uh, it's... It's a real compliment, I think, for the song. And also, I think, keeping the moody views is important for me because Mike doesn't tour and travel. And obviously, Ray doesn't. Unfortunately, Graham does now. So it's really important to keep that, for me, the moody blues music alive. Absolutely. Well, and for so many of us that grew up during these time frames, we were influenced. It, it's the soundtrack of our lives as well. 
And so many times we would think, where was I when I heard nice and white satin, you know, and who was I with and what was happening? And so it, it has a immortalizing kind of effect. And it's, it's so great that you're keeping that alive. Now, along with that, we should talk about how you're getting your particular sound, because that's an important part of the Moody Blues music. What gear are you playing on? That Fender, I know that's a, a stalwart of the the gear. Yeah, I don't use my original Fender on the stage because my original Fender for recording, I use uh, flat round strings, GHS flat round strings. But on stage, I use round wound strings, hmm. GHS. But Fender have been really good to me over the years. And I've got a sort of replica 1963 Fender jazz bass, but it's got all modern electronics on it. And uh, it w really works well on stage. And I use Line 6 for my bass rig, uh, Line 6 and Ampeg uh, speakers, 410s and 215s. And yeah, it seems to, uh, that's the sound I want. And uh, I think on the live album, you can hear the clarity mm -hmm. of the bass coming through this equipment. You know, ever since day one as a playing bass, I've built cabinet after cabinet and bought amplifier after amplifier, trying to find what works for me on stage. Um, for now, this is perfect for me on stage because it allows me to get my sound what I want. And because I'm in the ears anyway, mm -hmm. listening to it, but it allows me to get the sound that I want, but also it goes direct into my the PA system. And my sound engineer, Ray Nesbitt, knows every day it's going to be the same coming from me. Mm -hmm. All he's got to do then is fine tune the room. And for a bass player, that's really, that's really important. Totally. Well, and I think even the audience, they feel it. In addition to hearing it, they have to feel it when the room is right. It kind of goes through you right in the center. <laughs> yeah, it has, it has to hear you. It's the engine room, you know. Mm -hmm. It's no good in there having a car. The, you can't hear the engine. <laughs> You've got to have that, that, that's why they call them muscle cars, isn't it? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So as, as we are kind of coming out of the pandemic, there was a, a very interesting project you worked on, a recording in these crazy times. Yeah, I, you know, I, I go up to Naples where I have a home. And uh, in March the 8th and March the 9th, because of my grandson's 12th birthday on March the 14th. Nice. And so uh, we were prepared for a, a celebration. And then March the 12th, we got locked down. <laughs> so I didn't see him for three months. So it was a strange time. But I was sitting at home and uh, I didn't have a studio here, a couple of guitars, and I thought, what am I going to do? How long is this pandemic going to last? So I have to say, straight onto Amazon, get uh, my Apple computer and some electric Yamaha speakers and power speakers and keyboards and order all that uh, for Sweetwater, they're all turned on. <laughs> I thought, well, that's okay. What a good! I'd better learn how garage band works. So mm. I did. I, I've never bothered before because yeah. I like to play. I yeah. have no reason to. Mm. So and uh, one day I was sitting here strumming my guitar, and I wrote in these crazy times. And it was like what I was thinking was what everyone else was thinking. What are we going to do? do? And I wrote the song, and uh, I thought, well, I'm going to record it on my garage band. Mm -hmm. So I sat down and recorded the song on garage band, put the guitars down, and put the drums down, and put a microphone in my wardrobe, put
put sound sound uh, booth round it, recorded the vocals, and uh, I thought it needs some harmonies. So I said to my wife, "You've never sung before. I've got you've got to." Tr-. So I put it in the wardrobe with the microphone, mm-hmm. and she did the backing vocals. I couldn't believe how good they were. And I sent the files then to my son, who plays guitar, mm-hmm. but not for a living. He's, he, he love, he's a marketing guy and he loves that. But he loves Pink Floyd as well. So I said, come on, play guitar. And he played guitar and s- sent the files back to me. And I was astounded. Fantastic guitar playing. And then I sent to John Davison from Yes, I said, John, add some more vocals to this. We did. And I sent it to my sound engineer. I had to work out how to sing the files, but I didn't know how to do that. <laughs> I eventually sent it all to him. Then he sent it back to me and he said, you know, this is quite good, you know. <laughs> Garage rap. Yeah. And, uh, I sent it to my daughter Emily, who manages me, and she said, Daddy, you've got to release this because it's a moment in time. Absolutely. Everybody knows what you're on about. And I released it. I, I don't know how successful it was over here. I have no idea. But I know in England it was on the airwaves all the while. And so I was really pleased from my little home studio. <laughs> recorded this song absolutely well the the pandemic has pushed musicians into learning new things it has in many instances had them reinvent their efforts and i've spoken to many who have been doing long distance collaboration where before they would be in a studio now they are kind of figuring out how to do this at home and you know, figuring out the interface and all the details that you yeah. mentioned. Then I write another song called The Sun Will Shine. And it's about coming out of the epidemic, pandemic, coming mm-hmm. out of it. And I did that by doing my basic thing here, sent it to Alan Hewitt, my keyboard musical director. He brought all the keyboards on and then came back to me and I sent it off to my drummer Billy Ashworth and Billy put on the drums and he came back and sent it to Duffy King, my guitarist in Detroit. He bought the guitar on that came back and I sent it to my cello player Jason Chabra and he came put all his, all his on and I sent it then to Ray Nesbitt again, my studio uh, sound engineer. And we put it all together, and uh, then we mixed it and re- released it. And no studio in sight, except our own individual ones. And for me, that's opened up another way of recording now, completely, which I really like. Because when we first started, the creativity was one on one, one on two, one on three. Mm-hmm. And eventually, in the studio, everything was being done. Oh, it's a bass going on now, drums going on now, guitar going now. And there's no interaction. It may be great musical playing or whatever, but the interest for me is that interaction with two or three people, and you come up with something you never ever thought about before. Very nice, very nice. And with that, and looking ahead, because we're kind of on the tail end of the pandemic, I understand that you have tours and activities planned for next year, for 2022. Yeah, I'm starting a tour in March, actually down this eastern seaboard, I think, of America, ending up at the end of March, beginning of April, on the Flower Power Cruise, going down to the Caribbean, floating festival of music with the Hollies, uh, Zombies, Procol Harum, all the guys I know from the UK, and the American acts. I know Candida are on there and uh, a lot of other acts. I think it's 
going to be a great uh, cruise. I hope so. I'm looking forward to that. That is certainly something we're all looking forward to <laughs> as, as we can return to normalcy. And if people want to find out more details about like how to get on the cruise or how to find out where you're playing, where's the best place for them to look? Always on Moody Blues today because we still actively at Moody Blues and Threshold, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, but on johnlodge.com. johnlodge.com is the real way to find everything. Got you. And are you active on social media as well, or...? My daughter really runs all that. It's too much for me to <laughs> go, but it, absolutely on Twitter, uh, yeah, and uh, Facebook and all those things, yeah. But the IT, I'm a musician. I want to, I want to play my bass. Absolutely. To each his own. Well... Yeah. John, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to chat with us. We're looking very much forward to hearing the Royal Affair and After, to seeing you back on stage and on tour, because I'm sure that's very exciting. Folks, you've seen him here, John Lodge on Bass Musician Magazine. Thank you very much for the interview. And take care and stay safe. Absolutely. Absolutely.